And now for our next talk, please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, to talk about leveraging foundation models and LLMs for enterprise grade NLP, lead product manager at Snorkel AI, Christina Liopchin. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Very excited to be chatting. Let me share my screen. I'm going to assume it's working unless Rebecca tells me otherwise. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Christina. I'm one of the product managers at Snorkel AI. And I've been working a lot, especially on our foundation model product and really helping enterprises bridge the gap between foundation models and their use cases that they're seeing in the real world in their business day to day. So very excited to share with you what we've been working on and some of the learnings that we've seen over the last years. So uh, the, my agenda is kind of threefold, three sections. We'll start off talking about just in general, large language models in the enterprise context and some of the challenges that we've seen based on the customers we work with and just others in the market. Uh, we'll then talk about how one can actually adapt large language models to enterprise use cases, specifically focusing on the data-centric AI approach. And I'll walk through some of the snorkel AI approaches that we've used that uh, we've been validating and working with our customers on. And then I'll briefly dive into a kind of customer case study, a Fortune 500 a pharma company who has tried uh, bridging that gap and seen some of those challenges and how Snorkel and our product actually helped them overcome these challenges. All right, so let's start off by talking about large language models in the enterprise context. So uh, obviously, I'm sure you've seen the slide before, you know, we always talk about that the progress in AI over the past years has been incredible. And uh, there's more many accessible models nowadays getting put out there. You know, before, if you look even 10, 15 years ago, you needed to have ML PhDs in-house building those new architectures and coming up with models that you could actually deploy in production. Nowadays, open source is huge. There are so many also closed source models, but there's so many models popping up that are out there kind of ready to use, ready for enterprises to just jump in and start driving value with them when they think about their AI projects. And especially the recent advancements that are exciting to us are around large language models, really focusing on uh, the NLP problems that we've been working on for many years already, but really helping accelerate those problems in enterprise. But as exciting as these are, you know, we talk about it a lot. AI is not ready to work out of the box in enterprise setting. The same is true for large language models. Um, as exciting as they might be, you know, there's so many demos that there are out there that are really impressive. When it comes to real enterprise use cases, and as you start dissecting and understanding the problems businesses are trying to solve, it's not often as easy as putting together a demo or a prototype. Um, so Alex talked about this in his presentation, but you know, when you're trying to build something for a very generic, simple problem, maybe the large language model works out of the box, but the more bespoke, the more complicated the domain gets, that's where the large language model will likely struggle. Honestly, simply because it hasn't been trained on a lot of the data that might be important to your business. We're dealing with proprietary data, very, you know, private confidential information that the model hasn't been exposed to. And at the same time, when we talk about bringing something into production and enterprise, there's a very high bar in terms of quality and accuracy, and more so when we're talking about mission critical uh, use cases and really core business processes that impact the enterprise. Um, a good example I kind of like to use is, you know, there's a lot of uh, obviously hype now around the chat GPT and all these interactive functionalities. And I think knowledge management is something we hear a lot about, like in managing internal uh, knowledge bases, letting employees search for, you know, documentation internally, which is a very super valuable, uh, you know, hard problem to solve. But ultimately, the cost of the mistake in such a use case, if an internal employee can't find, you know, some documents as easily isn't as high as in some other use cases, because, you know, they can still use the old school way, kind of go look on Google Drive or whatever system you're using and find that document. Not great, but the cost of the mistake isn't high. When we're talking about some of these other use cases, uh, and I've laid out a few examples from what we're seeing with enterprises, is the cost of a mistake becomes much higher. When you're talking about something like know your customer banking, credit decisioning, insurance underwriting, patient risk assessment, clinical trial analyses, these are all very core processes to the business that have a very high cost of a mistake. And the quality bar becomes much higher for those enterprises when they consider deploying an AI solution. And that is true for large language models as well. So as amazing as they are, and uh, they're definitely a huge accelerant in terms of being able to uh, adapt and deploy um, mission critical, you know, enterprise AI solutions, there's still two key challenges uh, that we're seeing with our customers and in the market 
The first one is around low or kind of subpar accuracy. So really, how do you meet the accuracy requirements that you have for your business um, and address some of those LLM errors, hallucinations, as some call them? And this is really overcoming that lack of the domain knowledge that large language models have, lack of transparency. If it makes an error, it makes an error. There's really, it's hard to dig in and understand why and how do you actually address that error. And then the problem with the biased outputs. And then the second challenge, uh, or I guess bulk of challenges, is really around uh, deployment. How do you actually deploy these models in production within the costs and governance constraints? And that's especially important when we talk about enterprises. Um, there's different varying levels of infrastructure readiness that we're seeing. You know, a lot of these companies have been around for many, many years. So uh, they're definitely at various stages in terms of how their infrastructure, what it looks like, how it's set up, what they have access to, what they don't have access to. Um, there's also high compute costs when it comes to large language models. Uh, as exciting as it is, you know, to use ChatGPT or something, try running like that, something like that in production when you're maybe sending like millions of data points a day through it, um, might end up being quite costly, and that definitely taps into the profit margins there. Um, and then there's obviously the risk of proprietary data leaks. Uh, it's a very real risk in enterprise. It's something you know that uh, might not seem as important, but we hear about it all the time. You know, enterprises are very protective of their data. They handle a lot of PII in some cases also, you know, health, uh, health information. And that is information that is, needs to stay secure. And there's a lot of risks today with some of these solutions uh, that enterprises are afraid of. So how do we actually work through these challenges? Um, well, I'm gonna definitely talk about data-centric AI because that's what the conference is about, but I, I think it, it, it brings a really interesting perspective to how to actually address these problems and we'll talk about the customer case study as well. So old way, um, we talked about, you know, data scientists would usually go in and kind of tweak the model, uh, tweak a few features, adapt the architecture, and then solve the problem. Well, in the world of large language models, that really becomes unscalable and unsustainable. When you're dealing with billions of parameters, uh, figuring out which one to tweak where and how based on, you know, some hallucination that you went to somewhere or some error that you witnessed somewhere becomes really unattainable. Um, and that's where we as Snorkel really believe that that data development layer is becoming more and more key and more and more important, even as all these advancements in foundation models, large language models are starting to happen in the space. And what enterprises really need is a way to develop, to develop applications tailored to their tasks using their data. Um, ultimately, being able to pull together those four sources, their data, their internal knowledge, the tasks and the constraints they're working with plug that in and through that kind of data centric piece, really be able to develop an application that fits their needs, is deployable in their architecture and meets their requirements. And that's really where Snorkel has been focusing and trying to serve uh, that data centric development piece of that workflow. So for the sake of today's talk, I'll be mainly focusing on predictive AI applications. I know Alex gave a preview of some of the exciting things we'll be doing around generative AI and definitely stay tuned for the announcement next week as well. Uh, but the reason I'm focusing on predictive AI today is just based on working with our customers so far and, you know, seeing where we can actually help enterprises drive value today. It all comes back to those predictive AI applications. I gave a few use case examples on a slide before, um, but th this is somewhere where businesses already have clear business use cases outlined with measurable ROI. Um, it's you know very core to their business, be it, yeah, know your customer, once again, those clinical trial analyses, those use cases that have been around for a while and they've been trying to understand how to deploy AI there. Uh, there's also already well-defined testing and evaluation criteria, so they know exactly what, you know, what they're looking for in terms of what passes the bar, what doesn't. They know how to test it because it's such a core part of the process. Um, and then there's a clear path to deploying something in production and actually starting to derive value for it. So the point that we're trying to kind of work towards a snorkel is that we can help enterprises gather all that data, gather all that knowledge, and really translate that into those domain-specific AI applications that can be powered by large language models. So across various data inputs, across various ML paths, and across various industries and use cases, I mentioned some of them earlier, uh, the goal really is how do we help them adapt those large language models, work through those challenges to accelerate AI development. And the way we've been doing that is with Snorkel Flow, which has been our core product, um, and that we really have kind of transformed into this data platform for foundation models. 
So giving our customers the ability to bring in uh, kind of any foundation model they might have, additional knowledge sources they have internally that they need to ingrain in that final model, connecting to the relevant data sources, and then working through that data-centric loop and snorkel of discovering errors, understanding the errors, where they're coming from based on the data, and then being able to correct them through that programmatic feedback and labeling loop. Um, and as a result, there, you know, the customer can then go ahead and deploy the actual adapted foundation model, large language model that they find tuned through that data centric iteration piece. Or they can also choose to train another model as a result and um, leave with a distilled ML model. And these are the two kind of paths that we offer in Snorkel today that I just want to dive in and kind of explain uh, the rationale there and what we're offering. So when we're talking about data-centric development with large language models, the first path is really around adapting these models. So this may be for companies, you know, who are already in a place where the deployment maybe isn't as much as a challenge and they're ready to, you know, deploy GPT-4 or whatever other model uh, they would be interested in, but they're really struggling with that accuracy piece where the model just doesn't do well out of the box. So they need to train additionally on that uh, domain-specific data. So in that case, they're able to use Snorkel Flow for that guided iteration, understanding the errors, correcting the errors, retraining the actual large language model that they used, and then as a result, leave with a specialist model that is trained on their specific data, uh, validated you know, through, through and through with the performance and the accuracy targets that they need, and ultimately deploy that model into their process. But there's also another path that we offer, and uh, there's been some case studies that we published around actually the success of this approach as well, which has been appealing to a lot of enterprises who aren't yet at that stage where they're ready to deploy a large language model because of the cost and governance constraints that I mentioned before. So the second path is to still be able to utilize large language model knowledge, but ultimately distill it to train a smaller, more deployable model. So in that case, you can imagine getting started, you know, with something like a GPT-4, having it, you know, automatically label your data, understand where it is, isn't doing well. And ultimately through iterating on the data and then training a smaller model as a result that you're going to pull in and deploy. In that case, you're also getting the additional benefits. You're not only leaving, you know, with a specialist model, which you will be, but also a uh, lower cost, faster inference, um, not having to deal too much with, you know, resource constraints environments can be pretty challenging and very common in enterprise. So it just makes it easier to have a smaller model that doesn't have some of these uh, concerns. And it just creates an easier deployment, path to deployment to start driving value sooner than figuring out how do you actually deploy this monster model in production. And so just wanted to give a big preview of how adaptation uh, works specifically. You know, we do offer, and we kind of have this model library and uh, users actually have the ability to hook up with OpenAI and plug in a model like GPT-3, I think in this case, um, and then see what, you know, what the predictions look like, what the data looks like, what the accuracy is, and go through that iteration loop uh, within Snorkel and actually be able to then train and fine-tune the model from here. So you're seeing that on the screen right now and follow how actually that model um, performs in terms of accuracy, what we're seeing on this graph right here. And once it meets your bar and you're feeling ready to deploy, that's when you can kind of move along. But then the second path distillation is really around getting started with a foundation model. So in this case, we're picking a GBT4, for example, and seeing how does it do um, as you know an initial baseline on your data set. And once you kind of enter into what we call our Snorkel Flow Studio, you will already see initial predictions from that model and how it auto-labeled your data. And from there, you can see, okay, 53% in this case, not ideal. You can start drilling into the errors, analyzing it, but you're not forced to actually deploy GPT-4 in the end and train that model. You can choose any other model from our models with the models we support um, and then retrain that and deploy it externally. All right, so I'll just uh, wrap up with a customer uh, case study. I know this slide you've probably seen before. Um, so one of our uh, customers came to us with a problem where they, it was a, a clinical studies and they were trying to extract information that was a bit complicated because it, you know, was pretty uh, just plain text. There was, you need to extract the patient group, the result, but also the relationship between them. And when they tried using GPT-4 out of the box, uh, they landed at 66% accuracy, which definitely wasn't meeting the bar of what they were looking for. But with Snorkel Flow, we were able to help them within, you know, a few hours of adapting that model. So plugging in those initial predictions and then, you know, iterating, understanding the errors, refining those labeling functions, plus adding Snorkel's labeling functions that I'm sure you've heard about in previous talks as well. 
um, they got to 88%. So that is a 22 point increase uh, within really just a few hours, which uh, got them much closer to where they were looking to be. And the core features that really contributed to that was first that model guided error analysis. We talked about hallucinations and errors uh, of you know, those large language models and the lack of transparency. So Snorkel actually offers users that transparency. They can actually point users to, well, where are those buckets of errors? You know, how can you refine them? Um, where should you focus your time on refining your data to get the biggest performance boost? Um, the second bucket is around that programmatic labeling. So aside from just using that initial GPT-4 model, we were able to use additional models like BioBird, CyBird, public ontologies, and really distill all that information within Snorkel and provide labeling functions for the data to help boost performance. And in the end, the, this customer ended up deploying a smaller model. So we were able to distill all that knowledge from all these amazing models, some larger than others, but ultimately, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly which model it was, but it's something much smaller that was much more deployable and the customer had no concerns around, which is obviously very exciting, uh, being able to still use all this technology without having to deal with some of the, you know, governance constraints and uh, infrastructure uh, or restrictions. So that is all from me, a uh, very exciting case study. We're continuing to work on this and thanks to all, you know, our, our partners and our customers who are with us on this journey. Uh, we're very excited to continue working with you all. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, that was a fun perspective to see about how you've done so much with these large language models and foundation models, both adapting and distilling. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening here. Uh, we have some questions here for you. Um, the first one is working in enterprise often requires handling sensitive or confidential data. How is Snorkel handling this, especially when LLMs are often hosted by third parties? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. And one of the honestly biggest problems and biggest question we get from our customers as well. Um, I think the challenge is that um, still large language models, they're, they're large, right, for a reason. So it's not something you can roll, run locally on a CPU. And I talked about it briefly where varying enterprises have different states of you know, readiness when it comes to infrastructure and how ready they are to actually deploy a large language model. And one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, although these models are readily available and accessible, they often require sending out data to third parties. Um, and not all customers are there. So uh, the way we think about it as Snorkel is we, there's no kind of one approach fits all in this case, uh, because different customers will, you know, some who are ready, they're ready to go with that approach. Others might want something else. So we're trying to figure out how do we really position ourselves as that data development platform that integrates with all these various solution and providers to help our customers get access to what they're ready to get access to. So it might mean uh, having some smaller models that customers could actually run on prem. It might not be, you know, your GPT-4, obviously, but some other models that are open source that are accessible that we can figure out how to get to our customers on prem uh, install and enable them to at least start interacting with that technology. It might not be the best performance, right? But it's definitely going to get them a big way there and provide an improved experience. And in other cases, figuring out how do we, you know, make sure we're integrating with the common providers that our customers are dealing with. And then working together with them to also help set up, you know, private inference endpoints where uh, customers actually have that uh, capability and have the ability to do that. So it's really, I wouldn't say there's one, you know, solution, but it's making sure that we can cater to all these individual customers, make things accessible on-prem when a customer is looking for that, but also working with all the major cloud providers and making sure we're offering solutions there as well. Sounds like a lot of coordination to get the right models to the right people <laughs> in the right places. Uh, another question about large language models here, um, which ones do you integrate with and can customers bring their own models as well? Yeah, uh, that's also a great question. So uh, we do integrate. So we started off by uh, integrating with Honeyface and OpenAI natively. And this is like we call the one click, you know, integrations uh, smooth out of the box. But I think what we're seeing is, you know, similar to the infrastructure, I think different customers have different uh, interests in terms of providers that they want to bring in of LLMs. They might have some custom models as well that they have in-house that they're trying to integrate with. So the way we're building our solution is that, uh, you know, customers have the ability to integrate with some maybe common providers out of the box with this one-click integration that I mentioned. But if they have any custom integration or custom model that they want to bring in, they're able to uh, bring that in uh, through our SDK approach. And that is really tailored. We have all kind of documentation and templates around this of how to make that easier and more sustainable, uh, but giving customers the ability to be able to bring that in uh, into Snorkel as well. 
That's great. That's nice that they have that that option for their own model if if necessary. So you talked about hallucination and bias as some of the limitations of these large language models. What is Snorkel doing to address those limitations? Um, I, I think, yeah, that's where it comes back to really the data centric approach. Um, I think the challenge we've seen, you know, everyone's talking about a hallucination biases and it's been, uh, it's been pretty scary at times, you know, where people are just like, I don't know why Chad GPT would say that, <laughs> you know, like this uh, seems to come out of nowhere. And I think that that's the benefit of the data centric approach and really focusing on what data you're adapting that model onto to ultimately deploy it in your production. You have control of the data you're going to retrain it on and you have control to look into the actual errors and figure out how to guide it around these errors to ultimately get to the model you're wanting to deploy. So I think focusing on that data centric piece and the guided model, uh, model guided iteration error analysis piece is really where Snorkel stands out because it tries to add as much transparency as possible into something that is inherently non-transparent yet. I'm sure, you know, folks are working on that and it's definitely a big problem in the state, but at least in the meantime, data is the constant you can control. Um, so we're trying to enable our customers to do that. Very true to the theme of the conference uh, with that answer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, is there a specific pattern on customer usage of FMs that you've seen, either using it more to prepare the ground truth or more in model tuning? Um, where, where are they tending to use it? Yeah, so I think, and I'm talking specifically about enterprise, right, really large organizations like government organizations. I think right now where there is uh, really this the distillation path. So what we're seeing, you know, there's a lot of interest in uh, large language models and foundation models. But realistically, as we're starting you know, to, to talk to customers, understand use cases, understand their requirements and what they're trying to do, um, it ends up being kind of using large language models to um, accelerate, you know, the labeling, to um, accelerate that initial push, bring in all that information that these models might have, but ultimately combining it with other sources and training um, a smaller model that they feel more comfortable with as a result. That, that's really been most common so far. I think we'll continue to change, you know, we're, we're so early. Uh, I think more and more customers are trying to get ready and trying to figure out how do we actually fine tune these models. But there's obviously, uh, you know, a lot of processes in enterprise from like the legal standpoint and all the model kind of constraints and governance management. So, um, yeah, definitely still seeing them struggle through that. Um, perhaps a similar struggle. Uh, I'm sure this is something that enterprises are thinking about, but compute. How does Snorkel, do they package the compute that you need for FMs? How do they communicate what compute will be necessary? How are customers figuring out um, their infrastructure to, to host or use these FMs for inference or whatever it might be that they need to do. Yeah, uh, so that's, as I mentioned, you know, the customers we've been talking to, I think the setup is so varying that there hasn't been like a one size fits all solution here. Um, the, the way we think about it is uh, right now there's three buckets of customers that we're seeing. There's customers who have or have a path to get GPUs locally that they can attach, you know, to their instances and then run that compute locally for on-prem. There's customers who want to do it through third-party services where maybe they have already you know, relationships with cloud vendors and they want to utilize that and they're okay setting that up within their environment. And then there's customers who have some custom you know, LLM service somewhere within their private network that they're trying to call as part of Snorkel. Um, and right now, the way we're trying to structure our product is to make sure we're making offerings available across all of these and really actively working uh, to make that possible. And then within the product, we're ingraining a lot of functionality in terms of, you know, cost and like time estimates and really figuring out what does that FM usage look like to help at least guide our customers and inform them because some of these models are really large <laughs> and you don't want to accidentally start a job that, you know, is ultimately going to cost you a lot of money at the end. So I think it's both in terms of having the right infrastructure, but also having the right overview and management of actually the tooling and running these models and how to apply that to use cases. Would you say with those three buckets, are they pretty evenly split or is any of them seem to be a more common approach at this point? I mean, maybe it's too early to tell, but yeah, I think across enterprises, and once again, I'm really talking about uh, large enterprises here, uh, government agencies, most of them are still very kind of stuck onto that on-prem approach where they're just trying to figure out how do I run it locally because that's something I know is going to secure my data. I know it's not going anywhere. As much as they're trying to explore the other options, I think that's kind of the first conversation starter that they usually come into, uh, come into the conversations with Snorkel with. That makes sense. 
We've heard throughout today about a few different task types with information extraction, PDF, classification. Um, which of these do you see FMs being most useful with? Are they all, do they all have equal support? Um, what's kind of the relationship between those task types as well as foundation models? Yeah, I think uh, the most interesting one, and uh, it's where we think uh, foundation models, large language models, especially in NLP, can drive a lot of value. And what we've seen also resonate with customers has been, I think, advanced classification. I know there was a presentation earlier today uh, talking about this as well, but really talking about those multi-label use cases, also a very high cardinality when you're trying to, you know, classify into hundreds of classes that may also all be multi-label. So think like chatbots and things like that, very, you know, complex classification problems. I think that's where foundation models really help, uh, whether it's distilling or fine tuning, because you get that initial push where the large language model provides you with initial predictions and gets you kind of half the way there, maybe 80% there, you know, depending on how complex the problem is. And it's really only that last mile that is left for you rather than having to start from scratch. So it's really exciting to see how much we're able to accelerate solving these problems with this new technology. That's very exciting. Um, and another talk was talking about how we don't have um, baselines for a lot of um, performance if we're trying to compare different foundation models to each other. It's hard to know which one's better. Um, how does that tie into error analysis tools that are used in Snorkel Flow? Um, how do they evaluate how these FMs are performing um, and where the errors are? Yeah. So um, I think that's the benefit of uh, Snorkel being this tool that allows you, I had this slide where it's, you know, bring in kind of all the different models and all your knowledge sources and then go through that error analysis piece uh, within Snorkel. Uh, by being able to integrate with multiple models, you can run those, you know, jobs on your data set and figure out which model actually gives you the best baseline. Um, so whether, you know, it might be a GPT-4, whether it might be uh, Palm, you know, whatever other model you're looking to bring in and see how it does out of the box, you're able to do that with a snorkel by just essentially kicking off the jobs and then coming back and reviewing that um, one kind of after another and seeing which one actually gives you the best baseline. And from there, you have the flexibility to kind of go into the errors, right, understand them, figure out which ones you want to stick with, figure out which ones are maybe the best ones. And ultimately, also, as some of our folks, I'm sure, have mentioned in our presentations, we we also offer you to kind of layer those uh, models and those predictions and, and labeling functions on top of one another. And we actually have systems in place that help figure out the best label based on all of these sources together. Um, so it's not like, you know, you have to decide and you're stuck with one model and that's the one you have to deal with. You can definitely bring in multiple sources um, along the way and figure out how which one is going to work best for you as you go. Okay, thank you so much for this perspective on foundation models as well as large language models. Um, really, really enjoyed your talk today, Christina. Thank you, Rebecca.